Hi guys, welcome back to the New Leader Show. Here we speak about path of an entrepreneur to the success, from building a company, fundraising, and going to M&A. And today we have an amazing guest from M&A 2020, Anthony Arnold. Anthony is M&A private equity and venture partner in Barnes & Thunberg. He is an experienced lawyer who helps all sides of the deal to come to the best possible terms and get the most amazing outcomes. If you're a startup founder getting ready for M&A and looking for the right partners, you better watch this video, give us a like and share. Um, I'm, I'm going to focus uh, quickly on different types of M&A structures, which Serge touched on, as well as who your partners might be down the road. And we'll start with a quick note that Every road is different in the M&A process. Some roads are very short and direct. Other roads are more like the yellow brick road in the uh, Wizard of Oz, where you may have uh, you know, a scarecrow or a tin man or a cowardly lion. So just make sure you don't hire the cowardly lion as your M&A attorney, because that may get you in trouble. Um, I think um, the other aspect uh, that I wanted to address was essentially what the components of, of the team are. Um, we'll start with uh, the internal team uh, that's primarily uh, senior managers uh, within the company, including financial and operational functions, human resources. Obviously, everyone has a role to play in the M&A process, so uh, important to get those folks and subject matter experts lined up uh, quickly and make sure they're all involved. Ensure that due diligence and other uh, workflows are proceeding efficiently. Um, obviously, as I mentioned uh, a little while ago, uh, corporate legal counsel is very important. Uh, you end up becoming on the sell side very close to your corporate M&A counsel, uh, in touch with them very frequently. When I'm on the sell side, I'll have calls, uh, emails and text messages with clients uh, and their other advisors multiple times a day. Sometimes I would say between 20 and 30 times a day, we'll, uh, we'll send exchange emails, exchange text messages, uh, jump on calls. So uh, it is important to have a good relationship uh, with someone you trust and someone who's uh, competent, but who's not going to be obstructive. Sometimes we'll see sellers counsel who are, uh, you know, determined that a deal will not get done. So it's important to, I think, develop that rapport early on and make sure that you're aligned with someone who has the same, same goals as you. Uh, there are other uh, legal specialists who tend to become involved depending on the type of deal, including intellectual property specialists, labor specialists, regulatory specialists, or if there's non-US components to the deal, uh, foreign counsel as well. Um, other members of the team that are quite important include the, the accountants and tax specialists. I would say, um, you know, just as important as the lawyers in making sure the financial statements, accounting, uh, and tax matters are all lined up uh, prior to running a sale process. Uh, in addition, um, and last but not least, I would say we have investment bankers, business brokers, and financial advisors. Uh, not every deal has an investment banker. Some deals are what we call unbanked deals, but these individuals can be very key to um, facilitating uh, discussions among the parties and making sure that the deal proceeds uh, efficiently and without too much trouble. Um, just one quick note here, it's typical to have NDAs with both uh, these outside advisors, you know, for example, in, in a legal relationship, there is attorney-client privilege that's built into the engagement letter, but with other partners, you may want to uh, set up an NDA uh, at the beginning uh, that helps you protect your confidential information and ensures that, you know, assuming a deal happens, uh, all of that is, you know, protected for the benefit of the buyer, or if a deal doesn't happen, you still have confidentiality with respect to your information. Um, we'll jump quickly now to transaction structure. Uh, as Serge touched on, there are a number of different options when it comes to structuring a deal, and these typically get uh, hashed out very early on in the process uh, in the letter of intent stage or the term sheet stage, uh, so we can walk through uh, the various options. Uh, I think the most common uh, and probably the, the most well understood is an equity deal, which is essentially a sale of the stock or the equity interest of a company. And this includes leverage buyouts, uh, which is essentially a, a buyout uh, using equity as well as debt financing from a third party or from, uh, from a fund, a private equity fund, a debt fund uh, that is essentially financing the acquisition of the equity. Um, or management-led buyouts, which I know Graham's going to touch on next, which is essentially is a combination of management as well as capital partners, outside capital partners who support the management, and management ends up becoming owners of the company post-closing. Uh, now, equity deals can, uh, you know, consist of anything from zero to 100% of the equity being sold. Uh, you can sell a controlling stake, which uh, either is uh, in the form of preferred or common equity, 
Um, and so essentially what you have to do when you're structuring a deal is kind of accommodate the existing cap table. If for example, you have preferred equity holders who have uh, approval rights, you wanna make sure that's contemplated early on and those people are looped into discussions at the right time. Uh, there are options to also sell minority stakes. You know, and as Serge mentioned, this potentially gives you a second bite at the apple. We do quite a few deals where we have existing uh, founders or existing management uh, into the, uh, the combined company or the holding company that ends up being the acquirer. And so those folks uh, end up having, you know, a liquidity, liquidity event at the initial sale of minority stake as well as future liquidity event in the, the form of an IPO or an M&A um, in the future, which I think is, tends to be pretty appealing to some folks. Uh, the other options are a sale of the company itself, which you can achieve through a, a merger, either a for, forward merger where the target, so your company is absorbed by the buyer, or a reverse merger where uh, the target survives. So that's in case, you know, the brand value, for example, of your company is greater than that of the buyer, you want the brand to survive, then you would do that by a reverse merger. Uh, the other big category is an asset deal. And asset deals also uh, come in many shapes and sizes, including uh, sale of all the assets of a company, sale of specific assets, including intellectual property, or even uh, the form of an exclusive license where you have essentially someone who has the ability to uh, control the intellectual property or other assets of the company through a, through a license transaction. Uh, one other key element of the transaction structure to consider at the outset is how uh, option holders, stock option holders, profits interest holders are going to be treated. Uh, in some cases, there'll be an acceleration upon a change of control. In some cases, the buyer will prefer to terminate options and, and cash them out. So that's something to contemplate early on as well. And that's true also of convertible notes, uh, safes, other instruments that are outstanding at the closing, uh, warrants. Uh, you know, you want to make sure all of those are contemplated and, and, uh, and accounted for when you're putting together your letter of intent or your term sheet. Uh, the next uh, important kind of uh, element of an m and deal on the sort of the road to getting to closing is due diligence. Uh, so this can typically run in parallel with uh, negotiating a letter of intent or a term sheet. Um, you know, due diligence, uh, again, can be industry specific. For example, if you own a technology or an energy or a life science company, that will look different than the due diligence that a buyer will do in connection with the consumer products company, um, an industrial company, a manufacturer. So each, each deal has its own due diligence process. Um, I would say it's, it's important to, again, have your internal subject matter experts involved uh, in providing and furnishing potential buyers or investors with the information they're requesting through the due diligence process. Um, and the primary issues that uh, investors and buyers will focus on at the outset include the cap table, obviously making sure the cap table is accurate and documented, uh, whether any of the contracts that the company has are going to require consent uh, as a result of this transaction, um, and what sort of termination rights the counterparties to those contracts have as a result of this transaction. So all those things are what we call sell side due diligence, which is essentially what the company should be doing in preparation for a sale so they can answer all these questions um, of the buyer going forward. Uh, now we'll touch on uh, the structure of the deal uh, very quickly in the mechanics. So you can have deals that close uh, simultaneously with the signing of the purchase agreement. Uh, you can have deals that are non-simultaneous, what we call a, a delayed sign and close, which is essentially you sign the purchase agreement and then there's an interim period where the company continues to operate. Uh, there may be conditions to close such as regulatory approvals, uh, antitrust approvals, uh, or change of control uh, approvals from major uh, customers or suppliers that essentially you want to make sure are in hand before you close. So that's the reason for doing a delayed sign and close. Um, and then we get to uh, everybody's favorite part, which is what's the consideration? And so, you know, as you know, there are lots of different options with respect to how to structure a deal in terms of consideration and search touched on these as well. You know, cash is obviously king. Uh, if you're getting cashed out 100%, that's probably, I think, the, uh, the seller's preference. Um, sometimes we'll do a combination of cash and equity where the seller is getting um, essentially, you know, a portion in cash and a portion in the stock of the combined company. Um, or we have contingent uh, consideration, which is uh, in the form of an earnout or revenue sharing. So if the company performs at a certain level uh, post-closing, there'll be payments uh, to the seller going forward. And these can often extend three years, five years post-closing uh, and can kind of uh, really soup up the return for a seller 
uh, in a situation where there's not a lot of cash at closing, but the, the seller is looking for an upside going forward. Uh, other, other kinds of co uh, consideration that fit into that category would be a seller note, which is essentially seller financing the buyer to buy the company. So essentially the buyer would pay the seller going forward again over a period of two years, three years, five years, uh, with the maturity date and an acceleration on the change of control. So essentially, if the company sold again, that seller note gets paid out in full, uh, sometimes with a premium. And then, of course, we have uh, employment and consulting-based compensation, again, which Serge mentioned. You know, buyers are, are in some ways future bosses, so uh, it's important to consider that component of the consideration um, in, in evaluating a deal. Uh, I would say, you know, the, the purchase agreement it really has a few moving parts which are critical, uh, very important uh, to the buyer are the reps and warranties of the company. And this uh, relates again to the due diligence which the company is uh, conducting on the sell side. Reps and warranties range from, you know, everything regarding uh, lawsuits that the company may be involved in, employee benefits, uh, you know, every sort of aspect of the company that the buyer would want to know, they're asking for reps from the seller or from the company regarding the status of the company at, at closing. Um, <clears throat> these reps are often qualified by knowledge. So you'll have essentially, you know, to the knowledge of the seller, there is no outstanding litigation or all insurance policies are in effect and, you know, of the nature uh, that's common in uh, this industry. So it's important to determine internally, again, within the company, talking about the team, who's most knowledgeable about certain subjects so that they can review the reps and warranties, make sure they're accurate, and make sure the, the buyer is getting all the information they need to evaluate the accuracy and the, uh, the comprehensiveness of the reps and warranties. Uh, one of the other important moving parts in a purchase agreement is uh, what we call the standard covenants. And this relates to uh, items such as non-competes, non-solicitation of employees, customers, or suppliers, non-disparagement. Um, these covenants survive uh, closing oftentimes from one year to five years, depending on the jurisdiction. So it's very important to make sure that they're uh, read closely and uh, they're often items that are addressed in the LOI or term sheet stage because they are vital to both the buyer and the seller. Obviously the seller, if it's agreeing to constrain itself from uh, contacting certain employees or certain customers or engaging in certain business post-closing, they want to make sure they understand those constraints and are operating within them. Um, the purchase agreement will also address uh, various closing deliver deliveries, which again vary uh, on a deal by deal basis. Uh, everything from the stock certificates that the purchase is acquiring to uh, stockholder resolutions, board resolutions, employment agreements, uh, resignation letters if the buyer is not keeping on existing directors and officers, uh, escrow agreement if there is some sort of holdback or escrow component of a deal. Um, and then the, the last issue I want to address with the group is, uh, again, very important from both the buyer and the seller's perspective, which is the scope of the indemnity. And indemnity is a, a, you know, can sometimes be a pretty scary word, but it relates very closely to what we discussed already, which is the reps and warranties. So making sure they're accurate. Um, and indemnity can essentially survive uh, closing anywhere from 12 to 24 months. And it's essentially putting a portion of the purchase price to the consideration that the seller's receiving um, at risk post-closing if there is a breach or an inaccuracy of one of those reps and warranties, or if the seller breaches a covenant or there's some other special indemnity that the buyers negotiated, sometimes there'll be special indemnities for pre-closing tax uh, matters, existing litigation, certain purchase price adjustments. So that's a very important component. And again, uh, just to, to go full circle and uh, in the interest of time, this will be kind of my, my conclusion. It's very important to uh, be very careful about who you're choosing uh, to involve in the deal because uh, you know, obviously this risk with respect to indemnity and, and going forward obligations, you want to make sure, you know, if they're qualified, reps and warranties are qualified by knowledge or, uh, you know, there are other aspects of, of the reps and warranties that you're relying on internal sub subject matter experts for that they're, uh, you know, completely um, on board with the deal and are, you know, kind of looped into what's going on with the company and, and how to, uh, to make sure you're mitigating the risk post-closing as a result of the indemnity. Um, with that, I'll conclude. I think, you know, obviously, as I mentioned, there are a lot of different uh, types of teams that are assembled uh, for different deals. Each deal has its own story. Each seller has its own story. 
Um, and I'm, you know, more than happy to answer any questions now, or um, I, I believe I shared my email address in the chat if anyone has any questions going forward or, you know, wants to bounce ideas or thoughts off me, I'm, I'm more than welcome to uh, engage in that discussion uh, through email or, or uh, you know, if I respond, you'll see my uh, cell phone number in my signature. So I appreciate the chance to, uh, to discuss these issues with you. I know it's a, an exciting time anytime you're contemplating a sale and again, very important to consider both the, the process uh, from a full perspective, as well as the team members that you're uh, choosing to, to kind of uh, ride this ship with. You know, the, the NDAs uh, also come in many shapes and sizes. You know, I have clients that prefer, you know, if, if we're using our form of NDA, a one pager that's very simple and straightforward and says, you know, you just won't use the confidential information for any purpose other than what, you know, what we're evaluating in terms of this transaction. There are other NDAs that are super comprehensive, will include non-solicitation provisions, non-compete provisions. So I think um, it really comes down to enforcement and how likely you think uh, a counterparty to an NDA will be uh, to either breach the NDA or to, uh, to enforce it if they're, you know, if it's a reciprocal NDA where they're also sharing information. It's kind of a, a two-way street, right? That you want to make sure you're protecting their conf confidential information uh, and not not essentially exposing yourself to liability as a result of, of a breach because um, there could be liability attached to it. I think that's the take home point and hopefully addresses your question directly is I've seen situations where there are damages uh, to a company's trade secrets, to a company's um, confidential information as a result of a, a breach. And you just want to make sure everyone understands that uh, there's a risk there and you want to mitigate that risk by putting in place procedures to protect that information. Thanks again to Anthony, it was Anastasia Green, New Leader Show. And in the next video, we're going to learn about management buyouts from Graham Kerman. If you're interested in that subject, subscribe to our channel. You're going to find a lot of amazing insights for your business.